the cloud. Yep. Okay. Is it recording now? Okay, cool. Yep. All right, cool. Um, all right, let's get started. Uh, thank you, Alexi. Um, my name is Vaishal Shankar. I'm a final year PhD student, uh, just defended uh, a couple weeks ago uh, at UC Berkeley. I work with uh, Ben, ben Reck. And uh, yeah, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about some of my work over the last five years. So this is uh, basically just a rehash of my uh, PhD defense. So the general audience for this is like a general computer science audience because everyone in Berkeley uh, defenses are open in Berkeley. Uh, but there are like a few slides that are a little technical, but uh, most of it should be accessible. But if you're confused at any point, feel free to uh, uh, flag me down. So uh, the, uh, the whole idea of this talk is to talk about studying empirical phenomena in machine learning through the lens of this old algorithm or older algorithm called, uh, called kernels, if, you've, if you're familiar with that. So let's get started. Great. Um, oh wait, no. All right, so uh, I'm sure you guys have seen slides like this in uh, many talks. Machine learning is like uh, effectively fundamentally unavoidable in today's society. So whether you're like dealing with law enforcement, medical applications, of browsing the internet on Facebook, YouTube, or Netflix, uh, or ordering anything on Amazon, you've probably touched the machine learning system in some way, shape, or form. So, so it's already out there. The cat's out of the bag. Machine learning is interacting with real people, but we need to ask the question, if we're going to deploy machine learning in, uh, in real life, higher stakes scenarios, we have to understand whether we understand machine learning or because these systems can fail and they can fail in quite drastic ways. We know self-driving cars can crash. We know that translation systems can make pretty big mistakes. And we know that there's uh, uh, sy systemic bias in our society can get propagated into our machine learning systems. And we're sort of just automating bias uh, with, uh, by, automated, by using machine learning on just our raw data. So, in order to under, better understand uh, uh, machine learning, we got to go to the uh, the primary workhorse of machine learning in the last ten years. So, most state of the art algorithms in uh, speech, natural language processing, uh, uh, computer vision are based on artificial neural networks. So, so uh, we need to, we should be able to, we should understand this algorithm if we're going to make any sort of broad statement of machine machine learning, and. But the important thing to note is that this wasn't the algorithm of choice. Machine learning has been around for like 20, 30 years, or maybe 50, 60 years, depending on how you call it, what, what you call machine learning. Uh, but uh, neural networks have only been really popular since 2011. So in only the last 10 years or so, after they had phenomenal success in a particular task, which is the ImageNet object recognition task. Um, the actual algorithm isn't new. It's been around, this uh, uh, ANNs have been around since 1957. It was known as the perceptron back in the day. And, uh, and one fascinating thing about neural networks is that they do more than just uh, exceed uh, on standard benchmark tasks. They capture the imagination of the public. So we see New York uh, Times articles about the great AI awakening or uh, uh, AI labs that want to mimic the brain and they get a billion dollars from Microsoft. And this isn't, this isn't just a statement of the current time. Uh, in 1958, right after Rosenblatt uh, uh, published the original Perceptron paper, there was an article in the New York Times talking about a, the electronic brain that was teaching itself. So this, this, uh, this sense of neural networks mimicking the brain has been around for a long time. And it's even per, uh, permeated through our pop culture. So this is a, a, a line from one of my uh, favorite movies, uh, Terminator 2, where Arnold Schwarzenegger says, my CPU is a neural network processor, a learning computer. So even in fictional works, neural networks are the algorithm of choice. So, um, so this is like, so this is neural, uh, these are neural networks. These are important algorithms, and, but these aren't the only algorithms that exist. So let's look at the other side where we, let's look at a very simple algorithm. It's been around for much longer, and, but isn't used that much in machine learning, but used quite a lot outside of machine learning. So 
linear regression is simply the thing that you've done in, since eighth grade math, where you're just fitting lines to a, uh, fitting a line to a set of points. Whether you're doing this in, uh, in two dimensions or 100 dimensions, you're still effectively doing some form of linear regression. And it's the primary workhorse in many disciplines outside of machine learning. So if you're doing, if you're in epidemiology, economics, finance, linear regression is a tool in your tool belt. And this is much older than the perceptron. It's been around since the 1800s. It was introduced by Gauss and Legendre, uh, who it's attributed to uh, bumps back and forth. And though there aren't flashy New York Times articles about linear regression, uh, linear regression has, ha has, been fun, has been a core subroutine in, humanity, in some of humanity's greatest achievements. So uh, in, the lunar, uh, in the Apollo missions, the lunar module had a, fundamental, uh, the, ha had a fundamental stabilization routine that was just based on the least squares regression, which isn't surprising if you know how prevalent linear regression is. And every time you get a triangulation via GPS, it's solving a simple system of linear equations. So linear regression is an algorithm that's used in many, uh, in many real world applications, maybe not, maybe not that much in machine learning. So, so this gives us like a, tra uh, a set of trade-offs. So on one side, we have deep neural networks, which are the best tool for certain tasks, but if anyone's worked with a neural network, they know that they're exceeding complex and brittle. Like there are a lot of training in neural networks is a, I would still say still somewhat of an art. You need to know how to tune your learning rates. You need to know how, which architectures uh, are important. You need to know if batch norm, if you need batch norm, uh, if you need residual connections. So, but if you want the state of the art model for a vision task or an NLP task, the uh, state of the algorithm will be based on a neural network. On the other side, we have something like uh, uh, linear methods. So with, uh, this is a, it's sufficient and reliable when it works because it's not really doing that much. All it's doing is, again, fitting a, uh, fitting a line to a set of points. But it's, it doesn't really work for modern tasks. Uh, so like the analogy I like to think about is like the neural network is like an iPhone. It has all these fancy features. Uh, and it can take pictures, connect to the internet. And the Nokia is just a phone that can make phone calls. At the front, of, they can make, they can both make phone calls, but if you drop an iPhone, it's gonna break. Yeah, just an analogy I like to think about when I'm uh, working with these algorithms. So the central question in this talk is, how can we use these linear methods to better understand our machine learning systems? So, uh, and I'm gonna break this down into two, two parts that I'm gonna bounce back and forth between, and I'll explain why You'll, it'll become clear in a few slides. So one is that, is this fundamental? Can you have linear methods that can max predictive performance of neural networks? Because if you can, that tells us something about what neural networks are doing. Because if, if a linear method can get close, that means neural networks aren't approximating the brain in any way, because we know our intuition is that the brain isn't like a linear function. And then the second thing is that, do neural networks fail in the same exact ways that linear methods fail? So uh, let's start with the first branch first. So, uh, okay, so this is the, these two sides are the most technical slides. So I'm just gonna breeze through them, but if, uh, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Uh, so the way linear regression generally works is you have, uh, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, uh, you're gonna need to find some uh, 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 vector of, of weights theta, such that X theta is approximately equal to Y. And the way to think about this for like a standard classification task is what we're going to do is try to find a line that uh, that separates our data from uh, with one side of examples on one and so like dogs on one side and cats on the other. So so the way we would do this uh, is we would just regress our labels in the linear regression would be zero and one. So zero would be dog, one would be cat, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you would just solve this uh, simple optimization problem, which this is my favorite part of a linear regression. We don't actually have to worry about any sort of optimization routine. This is just something we can write in close form. So this is just, you take some derivative, set it to zero, and you get this equation. But this is like not that interesting, in my opinion, because linear methods, or their fundamental flaw is that they're linear. So they can only draw these straight lines. So if you if dogs and cats aren't separable in, by a linear, by a straight line, then you're kind of hosed. You want, what you want to do is model fundamentally nonlinear relationships with something like a linear, uh, linear method. 
So if you've, if you've taken a machine learning class before 2010, you've probably heard of the kernel trick. So the way this works is first we're gonna do this sleight of hand where what we're gonna do is just assume there exists some function that makes our space linear. So all I did is I took my last, the, uh, the equation of my last slide and replaced X with phi of X. And then once I do this, then I have a space where, uh, uh, I have a space where cats and dogs are linearly separable. Now the question is, how do I define this function that makes my space linearly separable? And this is where the kernel trick comes in. So the idea is, uh, because of the representative theorem, the op we can change the optimization problem to be a function of this matrix K. And K is gonna be, uh, is gonna be phi phi transpose. And the actual algebra here doesn't matter. All you, all you need to know is you can, you can rewrite the linear regression problem uh, to a, with this matrix K. And now K is just the similarity function between data points in your, uh, between all uh, data points in your space. So what, you, what you've done is you, instead of doing linear regression by coming up with some clever features, you just have to come up with a clever distance function. So, or similarity function. So if you can somehow ha come up with a function that takes in an image of a cat and an image of a cat and gives a high value, an image of a cat and an image of a dog and gives a low value, then you can separate cats and dogs in this space. And this is just like the math that makes it work. All right, so, so the, for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about how we come up with these similarity functions. Because these similarity functions are gonna be key in uh, making these linear methods actually work for, domain, for these interesting domains that we care about. So, so that's, the, that's the underlying meat and bones on how we're gonna use linear regression. But once we have this K, everything else is just standard. You just call like standard packages from NumPy or SciPy or whatever. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna compute the similarity between X and Z, two data points. So X and Z could be two cats, two dogs, two uh, pieces of strings, two uh, voice recordings. And we want, a, we want a similarity function that's nonlinear. So if you just have like tabular data, so here are some like just simple mathematical uh, uh, kernel functions they can use. So you can just take the linear similarity, which is just the dot product. And this will just, uh, if you use the similarity function, you're just going to do linear regression again. You're not going to transform the space in any way. You can do, use the quadratic kernel, which would just be equivalent to if you've ever done regression by adding uh, uh, quadratic terms. That's what the quadratic kernel does. And then you can do the RBF kernel, which is a very popular kernel that tries to, uh, that tries to capture an infinite number of uh, so whereas the quadratic only captures quadratic terms, you can think of the RBF kernel captures quadratic, cubic, quartic, and so on, an infinite number of terms decaying in some way. So these are simple kernels that people use for like tabular data. If your data isn't something like images or text and it doesn't have any structure, and you're just going to do linear regression anyway, uh, then you can use this. And turns out, so if you, if you have data that's like tabular, so if you just have data like this, turns out uh, uh, the kernel, this kernel works quite well. Uh, so this is a meta study on 90 uh, tabular data sets. And we basically see that uh, this RBF kernel does around as well as random forests and slightly better than a neural network. But this is sort of well known in the research community that if you have data that's like unstructured, uh, like tabular data, uh, neural networks don't really, ex uh, don't really perform well in this regime. So the interesting thing is where machine learning has made all its strides in the last 10 years is for structured data. So by structured data, I talk about things like speech, text, and images, right? Because like in, once you have something like this, you can't, just, you can't just vectorize your, you can't just think of it as a bag of numbers. So here's, here's an example uh, that I like to use where let's say you have two, uh, two images that are, uh, that are just random noise. And let's say I just, uh, one simple way is you can think of an image as just a vector where it's just a bag of numbers, right? This is a 32 by 32 pixel image with three color channels. So it's 30, 72 numbers. So I can take, I can just vectorize this and take the RBF kernel value. So ignore, just think of this as a giant spreadsheet with 30, 72 columns and take the RBF kernel value between the two, uh, these two images. And I get 0.997. I don't know what that means, uh, 
Does someone have a question? Uh, which 90 UCI data sets? Uh, I get, uh, uh, the, these are all like, it's like adult, I, I don't have the exact list in my head. I can, it's in the source. It's in the, it's in that one uh, paper. I can talk, I can pull it up after, but they're most, they're both continuous and discrete uh, uh, features and the, they're all classification tasks. Okay, so um, the, uh, so for these two images, the RBF kernel value is 0.997, and this doesn't actually tell me much, but maybe it means they're really correlated. But let's say I apply a permutation map to both these images, and turns out the image on the left becomes a frog, the image on the right becomes a truck. But the RBF kernel value doesn't change because the RBF kernel value is uh, invariant to these permutations. So whether you scramble the pixels or you have the, the correct arrangement of pixels, the kernel value is going to be the same. So it's sort of ignoring the structure between the pixels, which is why we need a better kernel function. We need a better similarity function that does more than just think of, think of our image as a, bag of vector, uh, as a bag of numbers, as a list of numbers. Okay, so what we want is an image kernel. We want something that takes X an image, Z an image, and uh, uh, give an output. And the really simple idea we're going to use and it's, it ends up being very powerful, is that we're just gonna compare subregions. <clears throat> so I'm gonna use something, I'm gonna take subregions and then just ignore the structure. So the way this works is I'm just gonna take two regions. Um, let's say, a, uh, so here I take a six by six region. So now I'm just gonna look at 108 numbers. So six by six region, and I'm gonna compare them with a simple kernel. So like, I'm just gonna throw away all structure in that, in that six by six region and I'm going to compare them. And uh, that's going to give me some one uh, value. I'm just comparing these two regions. And then what I'm going to do is just sum over all pairs of regions. So this is kind of expensive, uh, but they're pretty efficient approximations to do this. But uh, now what I'm doing is effectively what I'm doing is just <coughs> comparing all subregions in uh, these two images uh, with a simple kernel and, uh, and then sum the, summing them up so I get one value. So the way to think about this is that there's three steps. So there's a, I have to concatenate and get a subregion. Then I have to com compute a nonlinear uh, compute a nonlinear interaction between these two subregions, and then I have to sum the comparisons. So and I'm going to call this a convolutional kernel, and it's going to be called a single layer convolutional kernel. Uh, and the reason it's called a convolutional kernel is because it's like this. Uh, local patchwise comparison has this convolutional structure to it. And in fact, you can actually write this as a convolution. Um, so if you want to efficiently apply, uh, run this on a GPU, you end up writing this as a convolution. So, and I liked writing this in, in this like, sort of like network-like diagram, because if uh, people have seen uh, deep networks uh, represented as a, a series of operations. So I'm going to think of this as concatenate, compare, and sum. All right. So now let's see if the horse dances. Does it, does it work? So, uh, so these are three like papers I wrote earlier in my PhD using uh, using this method, where uh, we just saw these were just like applications where we just try to find applications of this algorithm. So one was this transcription factor binding site uh, detection algorithm, uh, the, the detection set problem, where there was a DNA string and we have to predict whether it's just a binary task of whether a uh, particular protein will bind to that DNA string or not. So just a binary task. It, we're given the string, does, this, does uh, protein ATPF, uh, ATFP or whatever uh, uh, bind to this location? And the way, to, the way we did this, we just, we just thought of the, uh, represented the string as a 1D image. So you can just represent A, C, G, A, and T as, as basis vectors in, uh, in, as one hot encodings in R4 and uh, run the exact same algorithm. And effectively when we wrote this paper, we found was this was on par or be slightly better than the state-of-the-art convolutional network for this task, which we were quite surprised. And it was like, uh, I think a, a thousand times faster. Uh, uh, the actual details of what, how it's faster are in, are in this paper, but uh, because this algorithm has a very efficient approximation, which I'm not gonna cover in this talk really. I can talk about it offline. Uh, uh, in my head, approximating these uh, algorithms is a different is is more of an engineering problem, a different problem than actually just trying to see if these 
kernel methods are performant. Okay, next. Uh, this is a silent image task where this is we worked with the, uh, the, uh, the startup in San Francisco called Planet, which gave us access to terabytes of silent image, silent, silent imagery. And we wanted to pr see if we could predict a particular outcome from space uh, in an efficient manner. So, uh, so this is like if we want to predict population from just images of uh, uh, images of the ground, and this isn't as useful in like the U.S., but it's very useful in uh, in if you were doing this in like Africa, where there isn't uh, good census data. So, uh, and then we predicted forest cover, and then again, same thing. Here we compare to a ResNet 50 because uh, that I trained because since we collected this data, there wasn't like a benchmark that we could just run. So we just took one of the state-of-the-art networks, uh, uh, not state-of-the-art, but like a easy to train network that was good at this task. Uh, Planet. Planet was the company. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so the question was what satellite image company is this? Uh, maybe I'll do questions at the end because uh, I guess it is sort of breaking the flow. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so again, we saw that it's within striking distance of a ResNet. And uh, the whole point was we didn't try that hard. This is, a, this is a very simple kernel function. And it's like, I would say comparable in performance. And again, our thing is much faster because we're using this efficient approximation. Um, and this is my favorite one of the tasks where we're, what we're trying to do is predict a solar flare by looking at a picture of the sun. So uh, uh, Eric, a postdoc I worked with, now he's a professor at Univ University of Chicago, uh, uh, had had this brilliant idea to uh, NASA has these satellite uh, these telescopes that just point at the sun and they're downloading terabytes of pictures of the sun and what they want to do is one of the problems they want to do is like given a picture of the sun they want to predict whether a solar flare is going to occur 24 or two hours in advance and so that's exactly what we did um, so we took a picture of the sun and try to predict whether a solar flare was going to happen and here the baseline wasn't a neural network because these were physicists. So what they had was a set of handwritten features that were like divergences and curls at particular locations in this image that they knew correlated with solar flares. And we found that our convolutional kernel captured all of that and exceeded it. And this is exactly the algorithm I talked about like four slides ago. So all three of these tasks, we just plugged and played this, uh, this uh, convolutional algorithm and it worked pretty well. And basically the high level idea is like, it's just a, accounting for a little bit of the structure in the input data and we get pretty far. Okay, but this isn't a totally fair comparison because neural networks were sort of tuned not on these tasks, but tuned on tasks like Safar, MNIST, and ImageNet. So we need to see how they do on these benchmark tasks. Uh, so one of the most important one of these benchmark tasks is ImageNet. So if, uh, if, you are, uh, if you aren't familiar with ImageNet, it's 1.2 million training images, 50K validation images. There's like a bunch of different uh, uh, dog breeds, animals, objects. And this is the data set that I would say has single-handedly pushed the field forward in the, uh, uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, Dishinder Malik is quoted as saying it's one of the most impactful papers in machine learning and computer vision in the last five years. Uh, because of progress that, uh, that resulted directly from this data set, AlexNet, now we have these large industrial labs, Google AI, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Facebook, that, uh, that, are, uh, that, are pushing, uh, that are pushing the progress of AI because of progress on this data set. And just last year in the uh, economic report of the president, there was a, the first ever chapter on AI, and this chapter had progress on, uh, on ImageNet as uh, as figure one. And it was just, they just labeled it AI because they were just using progress on ImageNet as a proxy for progress in AI. So this is a very, very important data set. So, it's a, so even though it's kind of silly, it's important we do good on, do well on it because it's, it's sort of the measuring stick that everyone's using. Unfortunately, it, it's, uh, it's very difficult to iterate on this data set because uh, it's huge. So there's another smaller data set that is that, again, the person who, uh, who wrote AlexNet and started the whole deep learning revolution, worked on this data set first, the FAR-10. It was introduced by Alex Truskowski. And uh, these are much smaller images, blurry images. And there's only 10 classes. But this is also a, uh, a very, very popular data set. Um, so for, uh, at, at NeurIPS last year, 
uh, at NeurIPS, basically the three most popular data sets are MNIST, Safar 10, and ImageNet. And MNIST is sort of a solved data set, like uh, most classifiers can get above 99 quite easily. So we're just gonna look at Safar and ImageNet. So how do we do on ImageNet? Unfortunately, this is okay. So this is the, I got I made this plot around year two of my PhD, and this was quite depressing. So essentially, there's like a forty percent gap between performance on ImageNet versus uh, performance uh, versus like a ResNet. So that's huge, right? That's like that's the difference between something to, uh, sort of working and not working at all. Uh, kind of disheartening. And then um, on so far ten, we saw a smaller gap of twelve percent. That's still significant it's like eight years of progress so we scratched our head and we were like what are the potential causes for this gap so this is like two years ago so one is that neural networks are fundamentally better at this task and that's interesting to know in its own right but the second which was uh which would have been more interesting to us uh, which was more interesting to us if it was true uh, or like if this if this direction was this direction uh, seemed more promising to us that neural networks actually overfit these, these tasks because everyone's me measuring progress on things like ImageNet and Safar 10 and these data sets have fixed test sets perhaps we're just overestimating our accuracy and we're just over overfit to these test sets so let's just see if this is true because if this is true then it doesn't really matter that neural networks are fundamentally better at the task if they're overfit so this is where we're going to switch to the second branch of the talk so basically we're gonna see if neural networks overfit, uh, neural networks and linear methods overfit at the same rate. So what is the ideal machine learning workflow? The ideal machine learning workflow is that you have a training set, a validating set, and a test set. So the way it works is you train, train a model on a training set, then you tune the model on the validation set, and then the day before you deploy or the day before you, uh, the day before you submit your paper, you compute the test accuracy on the test set, and then you submit. But this isn't what how machine learning is done, at least in uh, in academia. And my understanding is this isn't how the best models were actually uh, created. Uh, what we do, the way we've gotten our best models, the way we we have these efficient nets and inception nets and res nets, is that we download the best model that gets the best accuracy on a fixed test set. Then we tune that model by just looking at the accuracy on the test set. And then once we can maximize that accuracy, then we just release that model. So we've looked at the test set over and over and over and over again, which is theoretically a big no-no if you've taken an intro machine learning class. So now the question is, because we looked at the test set over and over and over again, do I have unreliable evaluations? Um, so like, here's progress on Safari 10 over the last 10 years. Uh, and all of these years use the exact same 10,000 images. So, and there are probably tens of thousands of evaluations on those 10,000 images over the last 10 years. Same exact thing for ImageNet. So overfitting really could be a problem. And this is what I would, uh, this is how I would uh, uh, describe overfitting like in a, in a cartoon is that if you plotted tested accuracy on the X axis and tested accuracy on new, on a new held out test set on the Y axis, what you would see is that over, over a long period of time, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna start plateauing on the truly held out data, whereas you're gonna keep making progress on the test set that you've been tuning on. So this is what we, this is what we thought was happening. So how we're going to do this, how we're gonna, how we're gonna test that this is happening. The way we did this was we contacted the authors of the original, uh, these original data sets and we constructed new test sets. So this took around two years of our life. Uh, uh, so this is a group of us at, uh, at Berkeley where we constructed a brand new ImageNet and a brand new Safar 10 test set. And so, and we try to make sure that these images were as close as possible to the test set that originally existed, but the images that themselves are new, close in distribution. So uh, we figured out how they set up the mechanical Turk task for ImageNet, for ImageNet and how they labeled images for Safar 10. And then now, now we can look at a, a classifier's accuracy on ImageNet and that classifier's accuracy on ImageNet v2. And sort of the gap tells us uh, how much it overfit in some sense, or, the, or so we thought. So this is, the, uh, this is what we uh, uh, plotted. After, after creating the test set. So let me explain this. So on the x-axis, I have 
the accuracy on the original test set. On the y-axis, I have the accuracy on this new test set that we created, ImageNet V2. So these images to the human eye look indistinguishable in terms of like, there it'll be a dog on one side on ImageNet V2, a different type of dog in ImageNet. So you won't be able to tell if images came from ImageNet V2 or ImageNet. Um, and we just measured a classifier's accuracy on both the uh, both uh, both test sets and plotted each blue point is one classifier. So the blue point on the far left, uh, on the far right, is like the state of the art model when we made this plot. So so this is this is I think this was like a. Uh, I want to say this was a ResNet 152 or a dense. I, I don't remember the exact the exact model uh, that that was the state of the art at this. Maybe an SE net. Doesn't matter. So the what we see is that the best model drops around 10%. But interestingly, all models seem to be dropping around 10%. Uh, and more interestingly, that the original the best models in the original test set still say the best model in the new test set which isn't like what we thought was going to happen. Basically what, what, what we instead, we thought we would get this like curve, but all models saw a drop in accuracy. So somehow we just made a harder test set, but okay. Uh, but let's, uh, what we were actually looking for is overfitting. And this doesn't seem to indicate that there's any sign of overfitting. Um, and then the interesting thing is that the kernel models also drop this much. So, uh, so this sort of like, at least on ImageNet, it doesn't seem like the image, if there's any sort of overfitting or any sort of uh, accuracy drop, it seems like the neural networks and kernels are just as susceptible. Exact same, uh, exact same phenomenon in Safar 10. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is the thing I was talking about where what we expected is a thing on the right. We'd expect that we thought we would see uh, overfitting in that uh, the original test accuracy would plateau and the new test act uh, with respect to the new test accuracy. But instead what we saw is the original test accuracy and uh, at every inch of progress we made in the original test accuracy translated to progress in the new test accuracy. And it's even more dramatic than that. Neural networks actually see a smaller drop in accuracy uh, for this fresh test set than the old, than the new, uh, than the old test set. For example, if you take our kernel and the wide ResNet, there, were not, there was a 9% difference on Safar 10. If you take our kernel and wide ResNet, there was a 15% difference on Safar 10.1. That means uh, the advantage between these, uh, uh, between these methods was exaggerated on a, on a held out fresh data, which is like the opposite of the hypothesis that we, uh, that we had going into this paper. So, Essentially, what like our takeaway from this paper is that overfitting was surprisingly absent. So our hypothesis was is, was effectively wrong. So over the last like even though the these data sets were used for for over a decade, the relative ordering is preserved. So this is kind of good news in that the way we're doing machine learning is still fine. The best model on uh, ImageNet is still the best model on a new slightly different ImageNet. Um, and this has been, uh, since then, this has been backed up by numerous follow-up works uh, uh, that show this is also true for transfer learning. Someone replicated this for MNIST. And then we wrote a, we actually did this uh, meta study using Kaggle, where uh, we did a meta-analysis of, in those graphs, kernels were orange, uh, which graphs? Which graphs? The the so the the circled points are the uh, 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 the circled points are the kernel points. Oh, uh, where the wide resonant and the, the yeah the wide resonant is like here somewhere, uh, and the kernel point the kernels are like here somewhere. Uh, yeah, and then we also repeated this experiment, uh, this a similar experiment on 112 cattle competitions. And effectively what we saw was that though there could be large changes in rankings uh, uh, for cattle competitions between a public leaderboard and a private leaderboard, and you can think of the public leaderboard as the, uh, as the held up, as the, uh, as a validation set that you can tune on, and the private leaderboard is a truly held out test set because you can only see it at the end. What we, what we saw 
was that your actual, if you just look at the difference in accuracy, it was always within noise or almost always within noise uh, that, and the noise depended on uh, statistical fluctuations on the size of the test set. So this doesn't mean that, uh, that the best, the, the best score, if you're rank one on the public leaderboard, you'll be rank one on the private leaderboard. But if you're rank one on a public leaderboard, uh, you, if you get accuracy 99% on the public leaderboard, your accuracy won't drop to like 50% on the private leaderboard in most cases. So this is we so this was another paper we published at Neurops last year. So after this, these three papers, we were quite convinced that it's pretty hard to do adaptive overfitting in this like bad sense that you learn in like an intro machine learning class. Uh, but this isn't all rosy. Distribution shift is still a real problem. So like for both of these things, we made a very small change in the test set, right? In that, in that we just resample the test set, but the actual images look very similar. This is a very benign change. This isn't like adversarial examples. And this small change was enough to cause a 10% drop in ImageNet and like a 7% drop in Safar 10. So it's around five to six years of progress that we just wiped away by creating a new test set. And this is definitely going to happen when you deploy machine learning models in production. And they're going to be worse than this because they're not going to be we tried as much as possible to make the images, make sure the images, if, so when we created ImageNet v2, we only took images from 2012 uh, and 2013 because the ImageNet, original ImageNet data set was constructed around that. But there are m many other distribution shifts that you can't control for and you can get a much larger accuracy drop. So uh, our conclusion was that like this accuracy drop was due to distribution shift and models are very, very, very uh, susceptible to distribution shift. And after this, we wrote another paper where we uh, created, a, uh, created a sort of natural distribution shift that was more controllable, where we just looked at video frames. And we, what we saw was that we can basically uh, create a very similar phenomenon by just taking a classifier, evaluating it on a, on a video frame, and then evaluating on the worst of the nearby frames. And even though the nearby frames are going to look identical, the classifier will make well, you can drop the classifier's accuracy by like 20%. So this is sort of like adversarial examples, except the images are just natural images. So again, this is just more, uh, uh, more field of the fire that distribution shifts are a real problem. So take away from this, we, we, we tried to show overfitting was a problem. We failed. We actually found the distribution shifts were a real problem, were the real problem, and kernels were just as good, just as bad for distribution shift as neural networks, which was, surprising, kind of disheartening when we did this, but like that's how science works. Sometimes you don't always get the hypothesis that you want. Uh, okay. And then, uh, and then one final thing to, uh, uh, to convince you that the distribution is a real problem. We also wrote a paper where we uh, checked, we, for at least for the ImageNet and ImageNet v2 example, we took a group of five of us, trained us on the ImageNet classification task, and made sure that our accuracies were the same between ImageNet and ImageNet v2. So like, if we created a harder, uh, harder test set, it's only harder for models. Humans perform around the same. So this is the same plot as before, but now we have these orange points, which are humans. And, and you see the orange points are near the dotted line, which is the y equals x line. So if a human gets 95% on image, ImageNet, uh, uh, ImageNet, they get roughly 95% on ImageNet v2. So which is good. Okay, so again, key takeaways, overfitting is not a problem. Distribution shifts are a real problem. 10 years of progress of neural networks is real. Okay, so this brings us back to kernels. Maybe neural networks are just fundamentally better than kernels at this task. And that is a possibility, but this might just be because we're just now, like after doing all this, what we, what we learned is that neural networks actually been doing uh, like, there's something fundamentally better about them, right? Because like then, then at least this one kernel that we're, we were comparing, the single layer kernel. And so we ruled out the second hypothesis. So maybe networks are fundamentally better at this task. So now the question is, can we improve our kernel so the networks aren't fundamentally better? And one thing that, uh, so after all this, I just stared at a ResNet diagram and our kernel, and I realized that there's a, we're comparing apples and oranges. 
the a, a, a very standard 34 layer ResNet has 34 layers. There's 34 non, there's over 34 non-linearities. Uh, there's many, they're looking at, you're looking at many spatial scales. And this is true for many different domains too, whether you're looking at uh, a speech or like a transformer or a, a speech network, they're usually very hierarchical. Whereas our convolutional kernel only has three steps, concatenate, compare, and sum. So in hindsight, this is quite dumb that we didn't think about this. Uh, we just turned our single layer convolutional kernel into a multi-layer convolutional kernel. So we're just going to stack more layers. Just like we're gonna stack, we can stack more layers for a network. We're gonna stack more layers for the kernel. The interesting thing is when you stack more layers for a, uh, for a network, you're actually adding more learnable parameters. You're adding more knobs that SGD can train. Whereas when you stack more layers for a kernel, you're just changing what this, uh, what this similarity function does. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna concatenate, compare, and we'll do a partial sum then concatenate, compare, and partial sum. And we're gonna repeat this until we get one value. So very similar idea, except now it's just like, we're gonna have, just like a ResNet has hierarchical structure, we're gonna have many steps. And, and then we're gonna call this our multi-layer convolutional kernel. So this actually took me four years to just think, to understand that I could do this. Uh, and this was a good idea. And I guess it took the, the segue to understanding, the, understanding that all this neural network progress is real to understand that like there's something fun fundamentally better about neural networks that uh, that led me to coming up with this uh, kind of uh, hierarchical kernel structure. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so the oh, so the so the initial. So the initial performance on SOFAR10, this is what we, this is applied I showed earlier. Uh, the convolutional kernel is around 12% worse, right? And so the wide resident has around 30 layers here, and the convolutional kernel has only two. So let's compare apples and apples. So first, let's compare a two-layer CNN with a two-layer kernel, and we have to see that two-layer CNN does worse than a two-layer kernel which just might be just because uh, there's not enough learnable parameters for the network to learn. But now what we can do is we can compare a five layer CNN with a five layer kernel and we see there's a 4% gap. Now we can compare a 10 layer CNN with a 10 layer kernel and we see there's a 3% gap. Uh, this three to 4% uh, varies. Uh, so now we were, we were at 83 before, now we're at 88. And then now we can add some data augmentation, which is like, which is a very simple uh, trick that again, bringing techniques from neural networks to linear methods. Uh, we can just add data augmentation to our kernel and now uh, accuracy increases again. So now we're around 3% difference. Again, remember the wide ResNet was at 95. Uh, but now what I'm doing is I'm just constructing the CNN and the kernel at the same time. So I'm comparing, uh, uh, I'm doing apples to apples. Then what I can do is I can just add more data augmentation. I can add flips, I can add crops, I can add cutout. And then the accuracy of the CNN goes up to 96%. Unfortunately, at this point, you can't actually evaluate the kernel at this uh, with all this data augmentation because uh, this is still like, this is like bleeding edge. This, like, this is like work from those published this year by CML. So this kernel is actually very expensive to evaluate. So every time you add data augmentation, increase the amount of the, uh, data set, you're going to, it's a quadratic dependence on the data set size. So this is, I'm working on this now, but, uh, but the interesting thing is that our CN, uh, like, there's now if we only compare apples to apples, there's only like a 3% gap. And now we've also improved our best kernel by 7%. Um, and this is like quite good for just a simple method that uh, only has a deterministic similarity function. And so this is what I'm working on. And then again, we did this on Safar 100. Um, a very similar phenomena here where uh, there is a 3% gap. Uh, oh, and another important thing is that I evaluated the original AlexNet accuracy and, and our kernel is now better than the original AlexNet accuracy. So our kernel is better than the original neural network that sort of spurred all this progress. But since then they've made 10 years of progress. But just catching up here was a lot of effort in its, in its own. Um, then uh, again, we have similar results in Safari 100. So it's a different data set with 100 classes. 
And so then there's this holy grail of ImageNet. So this is like my white whale of trying to, I want to get good actors in ImageNet before I graduate. And I will, I'm almost here. I have like a month before I submit my thesis. And uh, these are experiments that I'm doing right now. But basically there was originally this 40% gap, but, uh, and again, 1.2 million images is very large in that it's uh, hard to iterate. Even training a neural network takes around a week uh, on uh, ImageNet if you want to train a, like, a close to state of the art model. Uh, so what we did is we just subsampled the data set and looked at accuracies in that subsampled regime. And effectively what we saw was that, again, this iterating the kernel business works. So taking the depth idea, moving into linear regression works. And now we can basically bridge the gap between us, uh, uh, between a ResNet 50 and a uh, kernel by just adding layers. And this is also well known. The layers have like a diminishing effect. So the reason the ResNet 50 does well is because there's this residual connection that allows you to have identity layers. So layers that do nothing. So, but like basically we see that a six layer kernel is like edging in on the performance of ResNet 50. And I've actually improved these numbers. This, this, ends, up, this ends up being true even if you go to 80K, 160K. So I'm working on scaling this up to 1.2 million. Um, and uh, yeah, so like basically this is the accuracy, uh, like so the accuracy trend as you scale the amount of samples is quite reliable. So uh, yeah, I'm almost out of time, but the main takeaway is that linear methods, if you put enough elbow grease can be competitive for certain ML tasks. So we can't ignore all those scientific tasks they talked about earlier, but and then linear methods can be further improved by borrowing successful techniques from deep neural networks. Uh, so like data augmentation, this depth idea, uh, uh, even the idea of convolutions came from, I got the idea from CNNs because you're adapting to the structure of the data. You don't use, you don't use CNNs on tabular data, you use CNNs on image data. And then finally, this, this, uh, other, uh, uh, this other branch is that tested overfitting is not a huge problem for neural networks and linear methods. And distribution shifts are a huge problem for all methods. And we should be thinking about distribution shifts all the time. They're very scary. And the, the way we were able to do all this is careful experimentation. So these are all, uh, uh, this is due to very careful methodological experimentation is the only way we can find this phenomenon. We need better science like this. Uh, and so none of this would be possible without all my collaborators. So these are all the collaborators that have made all the work I talked about possible. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to stop and people have- uh, You can keep recording for the questions if folks ask questions, uh, right? So I think we got some questions in the chat. So feel free to answer those and uh, folks feel free to uh, ask questions live. Okay, can I ask verbally? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Can I just ask a quickie, uh, three slides ago on the- um, the, the graph with the 10, 20 percent, where the y-axis was 10, 20 percent. What was yeah. that? Was that the correlation between kernel? Oh, was no, that no, the no. So raw accuracy? accuracy? Just raw accuracy on just 41,000. Okay, sure. 41,000. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you might, I don't know, you might like to plot it on a log axis. It sounds good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. the number is so low that I assume that it has to be correlation because nobody would ever quote an accuracy of 10 percent. Uh, so I would explicitly label it accuracy, not okay, correlation. Yeah because I assumed it was correlation. Oh, no, no, so I, meant, I meant this was accuracy. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so this is, this, is like, this is just a common technique for models uh, for that, that we use for model selection, where these yeah. models that are really good at 1.2 million are still, uh, are still most perform, have better sample complexity and are better even at 41,000. Um, yeah, no, no, I got the point. Yeah, I was just trying to understand what the y-axis was. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I made this plot really quickly at the end. Uh, because like, I, 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 I got the spot the day I made my thesis doc. So uh, I just yeah. wanted a number to show I had some numbers. Yeah. On. No, no, sure. It was totally awesome. Thank you. Um, assuming kernel methods uh, reach parity in, uh, in, uh, in time, what would be the benefits using kernel methods instead of neural networks? Well, so this is, uh, okay. One is that if it's possible, I think scientifically it's in interesting just to know that this is possible. Uh, if we can get, okay, so if we can get kernel methods to reach parity and accuracy with the CNN, uh, uh, like a ResNet, then I think it's fundamentally possible to create a deterministic feature map that's like, doesn't look at your data, that you don't need any training, uh, where you can just pass your data through it and you get this like feature representation that, uh, that, uh, uh, that is the underlying feature representation of the kernel method. And you can just do linear regression on that. So it would, 
if this was true, it, if this conjecture was true, it would speed up machine learning by like orders of magnitude because you'd never have to train a neural network because you could just go, you could use all the other uh, uh, optimization algorithms that work on non-neural networks. Because the reason we have to use SGD, which is a fundamentally bad algorithm for optimization is because it seems to be the only algorithm that works well for training a neural network. But if we can reduce this to a feature representation, uh, a deterministic feature representation and a linear regression problem, then we can just use something like LBFGS or Newton's method or a, a variety of other methods and converge much quickly. So that's one example. And the other thing is just like a lot, there's a lot of te te techniques that exist in like statistical literature from like the last 50 years that we can use for uh, linear regression that we don't, we are trying, we're still trying to build analogs for uh, kernel uh, for neural networks. So like there are things like influence functions that tell you how different, how important certain data points are like that you can, they can you just compute for uh, linear regression that you can't do for uh, neural networks. Uh, you can uh, understanding like understanding uh, like if you want to do rapid retraining of certain parts of your uh, certain parts of your training set, that's like very trivial to do with the uh, with the with the linear method. But fundamentally, right now, I'm just trying to see if this is si like scientifically possible, because uh, this is just like a thing that I've been thinking about for the last four years. Uh, would it be fruitful to use analogous approaches or tabular methods? Uh, well, so the thing with tabular methods is that there aren't, there isn't much structure to exploit. So the anal, I think the thing is like, I think for tabular methods, I, I really don't think you can, uh, uh, you can beat like an ex a good, a finally two, two next you boost implementation, but I'm not sure. Uh, like, so all the stuff comes from like using structure. So, uh, if there's some structure in a tabular method, perhaps, and what was the big O, uh, 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 big O complexity of finding each of the kernels. I actually have a plot for this. Uh, yeah. I don't have the big O, but let me right. see. Like, yeah, I was thinking like when you, you show like 40K parameter accuracy, you know, if you can show how. Yeah, what, so yeah, what, uh, I, have a, I have a plot just for this. Um, yeah, it, it, but I'm saying if you can plot it on the same uh, series as the accuracy, so then we can see that like 40K parameters you know the accuracy ain't great, but it's it's very cheap to compute. Oh yeah, no, right now, right now, nothing is right now, nothing is cheap because these kernels are just uh, a uh, a. Uh, well, in general, what's the big O of of getting the forty k? Uh, the the big O is n squared d squared uh, is to construct the kernel matrix, and then it's n cubed to compute the uh, to compute the result. Uh, to compute uh, I'm sorry, n, n is the number of parameters or the number of rows uh, and n data? Is the number of uh, n is the number of data points. And d is uh, what? Uh, d is the, the size of the the size of the image. So, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to pull up. Okay, but the, the number of, uh, big O in terms of the number of parameters, you don't? So the number of, the, so the number of parameters in, in a kernel method is always going to be n by d. Uh, so okay. uh, it, it's a non-parametric, uh, uh, Regression methods. So, like, there's no lower complexity way of computing a kernel. No, no, no. So there could be. So the the, the important the important thing is uh, the 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 lower bound of how how fast you can approximate. This is just to compute the kernel exactly. So the nice part is because the uh, because the the kernel is a deterministic. Uh, uh, function uh, mm -hmm. because the kernel is a deterministic function. Uh, let me see if I can mm -hmm. again, uh, there's a lot of approximations that that are uh, that you can do to compute the kernel function. So for all the uh, for uh, uh, for all the scientific applications I talked about, where yeah. uh, the the big O complexity was like uh, m cubed, where m is like some small number of parameters. So m is like a thousand. So you can choose an approximation dimension. So here's a plot. Can you guys see my plot, uh, my screen? Yeah, this plot is great. I mean, I was just uh, talking about the, the lower left-hand quadrant of this sort of for very low accuracies of like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, if you can show the extension down to smaller. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so I, I don't know. So this is, I've only made this plot for like training on the entire data set. I don't know what, so the, 
that that ImageNet, yeah, I, I think that ImageNet uh, plot is just like a work in progress thing. I think mm. uh, we need to look at the we need to look at the the flops once we get the accuracies up to like the seventies, which is where which is where ResNet is. And I think that's possible. It's just like a bunch of engineering. But the reason I wanted to uh, uh, labor on this is that so so the the main thing about computing a kernel is you have to solve this kx equals b equation. And solving this equation is n cubed in terms of the number of data points. Uh, so kernel methods always depend on the number of data points. Well, op optimally solving it is, yeah, but you could yeah, yeah. But Monte like, Carlo it or something. Yeah, exactly. But like, even if you're solving it optimally, the, the number of floating point operations you have to do is still less than the number of floating point operations you do when you train a ResNet 50 to con uh, convergence. When you train a ResNet 50 to convergence, uh, uh, on a GPU. So the important thing that we forget is that mm -hmm. training these uh, networks on modern GPUs is extraordinarily expensive, but we have mm -hmm. extremely good tooling for it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't, so the, the main reason you can't solve KX equals B on a GPU is because we don't actually have very fast uh, out of GPU code for doing this. That's like available on like, that you can just like pip install. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas for training a ResNet, you can just download the latest version of PyTorch, and that's that will give you that will reach this like lower bound. Whereas here, I had to write my own solver to do this. Um, so I have done some work on like writing fast solvers to see if this is like possible. It's just like not very easy to use. Uh, and like, but uh, if I can come up with a good kernel function, I can make the optimization problem roughly as difficult as uh, uh, as training a ResNet. But right now, like the the hard part is like actually see the thing is like I don't even know if this is possible. Like may, maybe maybe as you maybe for these large data sets, these neural networks are just like 50, uh, 10, 20, 30 percent ahead. I don't think that's true, but I have to like convince myself that's not true. Sure. How do we get heur uh, heuristics, non-optimal so heuristic solutions to kx equals b in more efficient big O? You could, you could, yeah, you could get heuristic solutions. Uh, you can, I mean, you can use like uh, uh, coordinate descent or some sort of uh, uh, some uh, sort of. Uh, hello, sorry, algorithm. you're breaking up. Can you? You can use something sorry, like coordinate you descent or some sort of up. iterative algorithm. Repeat, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, you broke up. Could you repeat the last sentence? Please? Yeah, you could use something like coordinate descent or some sort of some sort of iterative algorithm, but the problem there is what we found is that the exact solution just always had better test accuracy. So just like, if you want to get the best performance, having the exact solution was always the best. This is also sort of true for training a network where like you need to optimize a network quite a bit to get the best test accuracy. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't really think the optimization problem is this is KX equals B is the difficult part. The hard part is actually figuring out what the correct K is, uh, which was the, the bulk of the the bulk of the difficulty, so like the bulk of the difficulty is just like figuring out how to do, like figuring out how to do like right now I can only do con things that are equivalent to cons, ReLUs, and average pooling, but maybe there are more units that give you better performance. And just constructing this is difficult right now because like what the kernel is is comparing all pairs of like sub sub images in a data set and that's just fundamentally expensive uh but is that a, wait, a weighted sum uh no it's just like it's just it's literally just a uh, it's just a sum of like the 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 way this kernel works is you take all if you have a data set of a million by million images you take all three by three patches compare uh, compare them and then you sum uh, sum them up in, in a small way and then you do and you do this comparison over and over again but there are no weights in that algorithm anymore. It, it doesn't need to have any weights. Uh, this and the reason it's you don't have to have any weights is because it ends up like so. Like theoretically, this con ends up converging to if you have a neural network that's initialized uh, as just uh, Gaussian, and you make the neural network infinitely wide, and just train the last layer, then these uh, these two algorithms converge to the exact same solution. Um, and there's no there's no weights for the algorithm, but you could add weights. And uh, you see the most. What do you see sure the most impactful? I actually don't know what the most impactful application of a multi-layer kernel is yet. Uh, like what I'm currently, what I think is there's a lot of applications where a single layer, is, like there's a lot of applications that are going to look like this. 
Like there's a lot of applications that are going to look like the genomics application or the, the remote sensing application where you can just use the simplest thing and you would have extracted basically all the juice from the problem because the problem wasn't that hard to, to begin with. And you can just like spend time doing other stuff. Uh, like it, it's, it's like the marginal value of getting like the extra 0 0.1, 0 0.01 uh, R2 might be uh, the difference between a convolutional kernel and like something much more expensive. So all of these use a very efficient version because this one layer, this one layer, this one layer version is quite easy to approximate. So if I'm doing this, I can, I can approximate this really quickly and I can do this on like a few seconds on a GPU. Uh, whereas the multi-layer thing ends up being quite expensive, but that's, that's because it's current research. Uh, there's multi. No, there's no gradients. I never have to take a single gradient when I'm doing any of this stuff because what I'm doing is I'm just solving the optimization problem directly. Uh, so what I do is once I construct K, then like so that was the point of this initial like the 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 whole point of this like this initial section was that once I write K, the optimize the the optimal solution to the optimization is just this just this matrix inverse, and I just compute that exactly. So there's no gradient. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The hard part is just like uh, constructing K can be very expensive or very cheap depending on uh, uh, how many layers you have be just because of the nature of the computation. Um, my, yeah, my paper uh, uh, goes into, it's called neural kernels without tangents. It was recently accepted to ICML uh, and goes into the details of like why it's more expensive when you have more layers uh, and we're working on it, but as in the reason, part of the reason this is like, uh, this is hard, this is bad right now is part, partly engineering. Cause it's like, I'm the only person that, cause like I have to come up with the algorithm and also write the CUDA code to do, do this stuff. So it ends up taking, it's a long cycle of, uh, of uh, iteration, but I, I haven't nailed down which parts are fundamentally slower and which parts are like, uh, uh, which parts are fundamentally like better. Like coming up with these kernels is a lot of work, uh, is, 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 a, is a lot of like tuning. But once you have the kernel functions to deterministic thing. Oh, do you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, we can do some sort of explainability. That's, uh, I think that's, that's uh, yeah. So like, that's like one of the, one of the uh, applications that you can do. Like, cause like uh, you have a linear method and uh, you can you can see what data points are important for the uh, optimal solution of your learning method. Yeah. I want to briefly talk about some of your previous work uh, mm -hmm. with regards to uh, overfitting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like one of the hypotheses that people have put forth is that. Um, you know, the overparameterization isn't really a problem because, uh, you know, you're, it's a, you're essentially giving your algorithm a search space and then it's going and finding sort of a subset of, uh, of connections within that search space, you know, kind of analogous to the lottery ticket hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had sort of any thoughts or insights along those lines or? Well, I think well, so. I think this. I think the overfitting, the overfitting uh, hypothesis is sort of orthogonal to that. In that, uh, this is this is fun beyond like the, the this distribution shift lack of overfitting thing is beyond uh, uh, just neural models. So even if you take a simple linear regression model or a one nearest neighbor model, which is this blue point down here, right? It's on this red line. And it still drops ten percent. So what uh, what this means is that whatever phenomena is causing the accuracies to drop ten percent and keeping the ordering preserved is beyond what uh, beyond uh, uh, is not specific to neural networks or or linear methods. It's just something to do with the way we're doing ERM uh, is a lot is makes the way we're doing these like uh, doing ERM makes our makes our classifiers fundamentally brittle when the input distribution changes, input distribution of images. Uh, and so like, and then, so if you look at the CIFAR things, so what happens is like, so I didn't actually plot this, but so here are kernel models. So here are some, uh, 
So uh, you can, there are some, like Alex it would be like here. And if, uh, when, when we improved our kernel, our kernel would, it was better than AlexNet, but like uh, it was also better than AlexNet on the new test set. So basically like all the, the this phenomena seems to be invariant to whether you're talking about a very over-parameterized neural network or a very skinny neural network or a just one nearest neighbor. So I think, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm pretty sure I've tested uh, networks that came out of the lottery ticket hypothesis, like the, the sparse networks, and they also fall in this red line. So there seems to be some sort of universal phenomena about just like if you change the test distribution a little bit, your all your accuracies either go up or down. We actually created a different test set where the accuracies all went up. So it's possible to go either direction. We just got unlucky twice here. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, cool, any more questions? Um, all right. If you don't have any other questions, let's all thank Baishal once again for an excellent talk and uh, follow up Q&A. Can I ask Baishal one? Yeah. Uh, kind of, kind of. I guess just the same as previous. But so when you mentioned that there's no resource in currently in um, uh, optimizing uh, finding the kernels, you know, uh, is there any? Does anybody care? I mean, is there any? Momentum well, that's doing that. That that that's that's the problem, right? I, I spent a while. I spent the first uh, two years of my PhD writing good solvers, but then I realized no one really cares unless kernels work, right? Well, that, well so that's what I'm trying. So, like, if if we assume the performance of kernel will always be worse than ResNet, then uh, why would people spend resource on on doing that? Yeah. Well, so that, that it, explainability, that, that, perhaps. What? It, because the explainability is better. Like, what's the the the, the business case for why people would? Uh, so, yeah, so, so the 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 fundamental the concrete applications I can see why how this would be powerful is if I can match the performance of uh, uh, of a resonant with the kernel method and come up with a uh, 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 come up with an efficient approximation for the uh, constructing the kernel matrix, which I do think is possible. So it's just like step one: show that the kernel can match the resonant. Once you can do that, assuming compute is not a problem, then trying to reduce the amount of compute is the follow-up problem, which you can do because these kernel functions are actually just deterministic functions of inputs rather than like some op uh, complicated optimization trajectory. You can actually come up with just a, you know, the way to think about this, you can think of, you can come up with some, a set of universal weights uh, that, that don't depend on your data. And then you can just uh, think of it as like a confident that you don't have to train. And you can just feed data through it and just train a linear model at the end. And if you could do that, then uh, that would uh, that would make deploying machine learning mo models and retraining machine learning models much more effective. Basically, if you can if you can keep the performance of neural networks, but then yeah. go back to training linear models, uh, tooling wise, like the things you can do are insane, in my opinion. So, but the problem is that we're not there yet. I think I think we're still probably like three, four years out from that being true, if it's true. And I I, I have like I have maybe put like sixty percent odds that this is actually possible. But if that's true, then uh, if we could just basically have it would be like having your cake and eating it too. So like, if you could have the performance of a neural network, but then have all the nice parts of uh, uh, a linear uh, linear model, why not? But like again, this is uh, uh, this is still like. Uh, research. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing this will take three to four years to come to fruition, but uh, then then we don't have to worry as much about whether like there's a lot of time invested in tuning and training these neural networks that would, could, you could just eliminate because a lot of the optimization problem becomes convex. Uh, a lot of these problems that are fundamental to neural networks goes away if you can reduce them to kernel methods. Yeah, but like, again, several years away. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, for a great question. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much again, Vaishal. It was awesome. Uh, appreciate the talk. And uh, we have a pretty good schedule for the rest of the month. We have Hagen, Pace uh, coming up and... Uh,